both my grandparents moved from, <clears throat> originally they, they worked for Brox in Sutton and then relocated with Brox when they moved to the Woodall Farm Estate or the Brox Estate, well, back in the, probably the 30s, 40s. And no, they went from Sutton to their house in Ranlar Road on the, their wedding day with a few bits and pieces to move into their house in Ranlar Road. And they got a bus from Sutton to Hemel Hempstead. Ranlar Road was owned by Brox. That's, they set Ranlar Road up and Vauxhall Road as well, which was part of the Brox's housing estate, really. So, oh, I've got people used to, from Brox's used to go around my granddad's house at 29 for haircuts and all that sort of thing. Um, he had a big garden, so he'd be distributing all his apples and stuff he grew in his garden, all to, you know, all the people that lived up the road. It was a real close-knit community. My granddad did the displays and my nan did um, the packing and making of fireworks in one of the, there was sheds scattered around everywhere on the, on the estate. Obviously, just in case if one went up, it wouldn't affect another manufacturing plant that's that's the way it was there you know you had to wear rubber boots um but everywhere you went obviously for sparks and stuff like that was stray gunpowder everywhere and it wasn't a foolproof operation there by any means you know there were quite a few deaths there mm. um i can remember him telling me when the war came they then went into, they used to make um, flares to drop out of planes for uh, boat spotting and stuff like that. And I know on one occasion, that, that was when he was part of the Brox's Fire Brigade, they'd had a young lad there. And apparently these flares that they made were really volatile. You had to, the cases on you, you had to handle with care. Um, and he was saying that on one occasion, nobody had told this young lad they were loading a lorry up. And he apparently dropped this box of flares down and the whole lot went up. And he, and he said that that lived with him forevermore. To them, in them days, I just think it was all part of the risks. You know, it was just accepted. That's the reason why we built these sheds, because more or less we know that one's going to go up. And that's why we'll put them separately. If we lose one, we've still got all this. You know, it's just mad, really, the way you, when you think about it now. Broxes used to always do the carnival at Tom Smith's fun fair. So whenever we were kids, we and we knew it was my granddad doing the display that night, we'd go down and help out just sticking a few flares and stuff like that, because they always used to have the, the uh, lance work, as they called it, done at the end with That's All Folks and Now to the Fair, which was a series of little flare fireworks, which as kids we used to stick on the pins for them and stuff. It was brilliant. I can remember at Hemel Carnival, they used to have a thing called a golden goose. And that, that was lance work, but it was a, a goose that was done in golden flares. And it used to be, well, I used to be the egg. So it used to be a goose that ran around. So you could see the goose lit up in gold flares. And then it would lay an egg out the back. In this, it would be, that would be flares in an egg. Um, and I was the egg. If I was a kid, I'd, I'd let me do the egg. So somebody had set fire to the, the flares. The goose had run around. You'd have to keep up with him, whoever was running around. And then he'd go, right, go on in. And then you'd just drop behind so it looks like it's laid a golden egg. That was part of the, that was part of the show. If you look on um, a lot of the old Brox's footage it, during the war, they had a similar thing, but it was on a massive scale. They'd do... Um, like ships getting bombed and, you know, like all different things. that They did have at the time as well asbestos suits with shapes of boxers. So you'd have two blokes in these asbestos suits with flares on the so on, showing on their side, boxing each other, and all it was was asbestos suits with these flares glued to them. Oh, at that time, all of the big shows were hand-fired as well. You had to actually light the fuse to do it. Now we do everything with computers. But at that time, it was dangerous because if, you, if you're letting off six of these mortars, a row of mortar tubes, and one doesn't go and you don't see it, it could come out, it could take your head off. I can remember um, a mortar shell 
came out and hit my granddad in the neck. Um, it didn't burn him, but it made a give him a nasty cut on his neck. My granddad used to always talk of, and I can't remember the guy's name now, but my granddad used to say he used to be the one that tested all the fireworks. There was a testing ground at the top of the at the top of the compound where he would go into the sheds. He's letting these fireworks off, and there's stuff flying over his head. He's coming over. No safety whatsoever. He's just got a white coat on. It's mad the way you look at it, but that's the way things were done in them days. I was proud of my granddad. You know, you see the things that he used to do, and I'm proud of him. You know, and I'm proud of me now as well, what, what they put up with, really, working on in them sort of conditions. She, I mean, I remember me nan saying that she said, well, I was leaning over, it was that cold that the dew drops were dripping off of her nose and going into the fireworks. You know, she used to tell me stuff like that, you know, with her, their feet in a bucket of hot water to keep them warm. I'd like to talk about uh, talk a bit about my my religion, which is Zoroastrianism. It's divided into two like sects. It's Irani and Parsi. I myself am a Parsi, and we uh, both these sects of the religion have a very important cultural and religious like an event, a festival. It's called a Muktar. So they are a month apart from each other in July and August, respectively, and they are 10 days long each. It's basically a religious observance performed to connect with the souls of the deceased. So prayers are done and um, like food is offered to them. So to set up for the Muktar, the fire temple or the Agyari where the event is held is cleaned. Tables are set up. And on each table, you put uh, a picture of the person who, who you're honoring, the, the deceased person, either someone in the past year or from, from like even years ago. It, it depends on the family, whether they want to put up a table or not. And uh, also, along with the picture, a specific vase is placed with flowers in it, which are changed every day. And the vase is chosen by the family as like a symbol of like a symbol of continuity. The fresh flowers that are put in these vases are also used to honor the dead people. And on each table, there is an earthen lamp or uh, like we use metal bowls for them. And uh, we relight the lamps every time they get extinguished. We don't let them stay extinguished for a very long time. And every day in the morning, the priests, they pray a prayer called an Afargan. So uh, for the souls of the deceased person, so this is every day for the 10 days of the event. And they pray upon fire, which is our religious symbol. It's what we pray to. There's fruits and flowers kept in the area where the priests are praying to bless the fruit. And then that fruit is given to the family after the end of the prayer. So they can take it home and they can eat it. So it's like the, the fruit has been prayed upon, has been purified, and then you eat it, uh, which basically makes you a part of the ceremony as well. And on particular days, uh, there's something called a jashan, which is like a special prayer offered for an individual person. So the family can approach the priests, book a day where they will all be available. And the priests pray for that particular family after the normal prayers are concluded. The last five days of the Muktad are very important because these uh, signify the time period when the souls of the deceased come back from the afterlife to accept our prayers and offerings. And on the last day, a special prayer is performed, which helped them return back to the afterlife. And that marks the end of the 10-day Muktad period. It's like the souls feel satisfied. They are happy, and then they return back, uh, and they, they are at peace, finally. When I was a child, I don't remember much, of course. I must have been six or five or six, and... We had gone for one of my uh, my grandfather's prayers, and uh, so so my dad, my father, he's a priest. Uh, he's a he's a Parsi priest. So I know a lot about the event, and he was the one doing the prayers. 
And I remember just looking at the fire burning while they were, you know, calling out my grandfather's name. They call out all the family members' names uh, along with the prayers. And I remember actually feeling a sense of peace when I when I saw the fire burning. I don't know what it is, but it it just brought like great, great peace to me. Not everyone has a picture of their loved one on the table itself, but they do. We have like name, um, like name plaques on for each table. It's written in Gujarati. Uh, it's not written in English. And it, it's just the only significance is that you get an, a table number assigned to you. The, the family gets a table number assigned and then they go there and they are allowed to go kneel at the table or pray or, you know, talk to their loved ones and connect with them, which is something I do a lot every Muktad. My uh, one table has my grandfather and my great grandmother. And I don't know, it's just every time I go and see the table, I feel I feel good, I feel happy, but I also, I cry every single year. When I was in my 20s, I went to get a job there and I got a job driving. And basically part of my job was delivering shortages on fireworks. I was working from the stores and things soon changed because one of the directors there was losing his eyesight. So I very very quickly become a chauffeur to him, mainly just collecting him in the morning from his house and taking him home again in the evening. And then once a week, I would take him up to one of the other factories that Brock's Fireworks had. He was a guy called Mr. Innes, and he was the production director. So quite an important person, I think. Sometimes he was so tired after a day's work, he would just fall asleep and fall asleep on my shoulder sometimes, which was a bit difficult. Uh, I would just go around a corner a bit quick just to push him back over his side. I mean, I didn't do that all the time. I was still going out on the odd occasion delivering uh, parcels, shortages of fireworks mainly, because back in the 60s, every shop had uh, fireworks. When you come into the factory, um, you had to go into the gatehouse and, and clock in. But part of that clocking in process also was any metallic objects that you had on you, you had to put in a, a safe deposit box. You weren't allowed to take anything metallic up to where there was uh, explosives around or any sort of chemicals around. So halfway up the um, the hill into the factory was that there was a sort of dividing line and you couldn't go past that line unless you deposited all your um all your metallic goods i used to um i used to talk to a guy called dr hall he was a he was what they called the chemist there he had a laboratory in the office area and um but i got on got on quite well with him and a couple of times i used to go with him because it was his job to burn all the waste material so now and again we would get a tractor and a trailer and he'd, he'd recruit two or three people and um, we'd go up past all the uh, all the little huts making the fireworks up to the testing ground and he would um, put all these chemicals in the middle of a field with a fuse to them and then we would all get down in this little hideout and he'd set light to the fuse and it was like an atom bomb going off no no noise but the it looked like a big white cloud and I'm sure people all over that area of Hemel would tell you that they used to see it I think in the lorry I did used to deliver um home homework out to there's a lot of people would do homework out in the community nothing to do with um making the fireworks up but they would roll the tubes. And basically what that was, we would take out boxes and boxes of cardboard tubes and labels. And it was their job just to put a bit of glue on the tube and, and glue the label to the tube. And, and that's all they used to do on a, on a sort of a homework or outwork basis. I can even remember going to Leaveston Hospital. I don't think that's there anymore. Uh, that was a psychiatric hospital. And I can remember going there and taking them there. So they must have got the patients there to do them. Because I, I remember reversing the lorry up to the hospital one day and didn't really know what was happening but this guy was in my mirror and he was saying come on come on come on and all of a sudden I hit a wall and all I could see in my mirror was this guy giggling and laughing and running away well he was a patient <laughs> he thought it was funny backing me into the wall <laughs> 